expert on the future of work. His research focuses on applied technical and policy methods to address ethical, safety, and inclusivity concerns in using artificial intelligence in different domains. He has built the largest community-driven public consultation group on artificial intelligence ethics in the world. Thank you, Abhishek, to join us. And thank you for bringing us as well the challenges. And now I'll leave it to you. Awesome. OK, well, thank you, uh, David, Arjun, and Vera, and IDRC, and everybody for welcoming me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I will uh, try to build on uh, the discussions that everybody had from last week. So I uh, watched through the session and uh, certainly found it very interesting and enlightening. Uh, both Julie and Alexander did a fantastic job. So I'll try and build on what they've already said, uh, minimize repetition so that uh, we go into our scenarios with uh, you know, uh, a few more dimensions on what it takes to build um, ethical and inclusive AI systems. Okay, so I will try and share my screen and uh, uh, y'all can let me know if uh, and when you're able to see it. And I'm gonna go full screen here and hope that you still see it. I think you still see it, I believe. We can still see it. Awesome, okay, cool. All right, so yeah, I guess um, uh, David already introduced me. So, um, and, and by the way, I, I will uh, share the slides after uh, in case folks are interested. Cool, so um, the way I am gonna approach our discussion today is to look at uh, this from, an, uh, from a life cycle perspective, because I think it's very important uh, when we're looking at the notions of bias and discrimination, and I'll also cover a few more areas um, in uh, AI ethics that are important, but I think the life cycle perspective is really important uh, because it helps us to find the right points of intervention uh, that will help you, um, will basically help you uh, find the most effective uh, means of creating change. Uh, because when we talk about things like algorithmic bias, uh, often uh, those discussions can uh, miss some of the uh, points of intervention, which actually can be more effective in certain situations uh, than others. And so um, the way we're going to talk about the life cycle is to look at it from uh, an ideation conception uh, standpoint, uh, then move on to data collection, uh, then talk about design, uh, development, TEVV, which is um, testing, evaluation, verification, validation, uh, look at deployment, look at maintenance and uh, end of life uh, for, for that. Cool, so uh, what does the AI lifecycle look like? So the first part of, I guess, any project, uh, it's not just AI, is the ideation and conception phase. And, and that's really when we're thinking about um, uh, what is it that we're trying to solve, right? Uh, what, is it the, uh, what is the problem that we're trying to address? And, and I guess in the context of uh, hiring, we're really thinking about uh, trying to find uh, the best candidates uh, possible uh, for um, uh, whatever job it is that we're trying to fulfill. And, and what's really important here is to uh, make sure that that goal stays uh, front and center throughout the entire life cycle, because often what happens as you're trying to bring in these hiring processes uh, be that uh, through uh, an organizational change or be that through some technical tools that you're looking to use. Uh, it's important to keep that goal in mind. And, and of course, the speakers last week uh, also mentioned that uh, we want to be careful in terms of making sure that we're actually evaluating for um, the kind of skills that will actually be relevant uh, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the, uh, the functions that people are expected to perform on the job. So uh, what I will do in each of these phases is leave you with a little provocation uh, that I hope will be useful, not just in the challenges that we will discuss in the co-design part of the session, but also uh, in generally thinking about um, AI. So um, 
in in the ideation and conception phase it can be uh, useful to think about what we can change in terms of the third party procurement processes uh, when it comes to acquiring some of these systems so it's not just um, thinking about uh, whether you want to build that solution yourself often you might just go out and procure them from companies like hireview which has faced a lot of flack recently for um, uh, the sort of discriminatory practices that have been enshrined in code uh, when it comes to uh, automated decision making, and so what can we change about that third-party procurement process? Be that uh, being smarter about uh, how we go about um, uh, evaluating those systems, and and also making sure that they actually align with the goals that we have uh, that we're trying to achieve uh, during the hiring process. Uh, and well, let's say you go the route of building uh, that AI system yourself when it comes to hiring, um, uh, then one of the most important phases, of course, is data collection. Um, this is fantastic uh, piece of work um, here that I would like to highlight, which is called the Library of Missing Data Sets by Mimi Onuoha, uh, which uh, really talks about uh, some of the things that one might expect you have data sets around, uh, but you don't. Um, and, and this is really crucial when we're thinking about um, the notions of disability uh, and how they relate to uh, that entire uh, hiring life cycle that was um, uh, mentioned by Julia in, in, in the last week, uh, uh, in the discussions from last week. And it's important to think about what those missing pieces of data are if you are to go the route of uh, utilizing um, and and uh, you know homegrown or inbuilt um, uh, in-house sorry uh, uh, AI system that will go about doing this hiring because uh, without adequate representation in the data you really do risk uh, uh, exclusion and and of course I you know we'll we'll talk about this later as well but just having sufficient data is also not enough it uh, sometimes you do need to think about uh, some of the extra dimensions that are not captured, especially when it comes to the heterogeneity of um, uh, the people who are um, uh, people with disabilities, because the way that they get manifested uh, uh, can be quite different uh, uh, between different individuals, and it's and it's not sufficient uh, to um, uh, to just have a rigid uh, categorization um, uh, that that might. Um, be used in the context of uh, creating these data sets um, as they are used. And uh, you know, one of the things that was alluded to last time was uh, this notion of data trust that might be useful. And when we're talking about data trust, um, uh, one of the notions uh, that sort of goes hand in hand with the concept of data trust is the notion of data commons. So how do we share some of the data that we have um, uh, that defines uh, us uh, in a sense. Uh, how do we share that in a way that actually benefits all of us? So data commons is, is one way of um, talking about that. So going uh, you know, along in that life cycle, we can talk about um, sort of design um, as, as the next phase, which is, which is really important because here we, we have to ask this very critical question of, um, of feasibility. And, and feasibility when we're thinking about whether the solution that you're designing, uh, say for example, you know, automating um, some of that hiring process, is it actually helping you achieve efficiency and, and at what cost? Uh, what are some of the design considerations when it comes to um, the, uh, the decisions that are being made, uh, the efficiency that's being gained uh, and, and who might be left out? And so in, in terms of a provocation, it's, it's probably, Quite important here to think about uh, if if some solution should even be made, uh, and and especially from the perspective of feasibility, because if you're trying to predict something uh, from a data set which doesn't have the necessary signals within it, uh, you are essentially distorting um, your goals to now start to fit to the solution, and this is something that happens a lot uh, when you talk about techno uh, techno solutionism which is basically this idea that you're trying to uh, impose technology as a means of solving a particular problem where you're distorting your goals and you're 
solutions to the point where um, you know you're reaching a place where uh, the the solutions weren't feasible to begin with, but uh, you, in the interest of or in the desire to want to deploy technology, uh, have distorted your goal. So the design phase is is one where you really want to think about uh, the feasibility of that solution. Um, and so development uh, really is when you you know sort of put your you know hands on the keyboard, you start writing out some of those algorithms uh, and and that code. Uh, to uh, build out that system, an important provocation here, uh, something to th uh, something to think about is well, what kind of techniques are we selecting? And this is again, you know, it goes back to thinking about some of those trade-offs in terms of um, if you're choosing to use some more complicated um, techniques with the hopes that they have uh, more predictive power. Uh, there is a strong possibility there that uh, you might be sacrificing. Um, let's say explainability in the interest of getting more accuracy. Um, now this is an important phase, uh, testing, evalu evaluation, verification, and validation. Um, this is essentially our opportunity to sort of crack open that black box uh, of the AI system. And I know, again, this was something that was discussed um, last time where, you know, there's uh, the more complicated techniques that you're um, uh, using, uh, the more there is a possibility that um, you know, we are uh, sort of sacrificing our ability to understand why certain decisions are being made, why certain people are, are preferred over others. Um, let's say, you know, you have an individual X and an individual Y who have all of their characteristics that are similar, uh, except one characteristic. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it would be easy to see why a decision was made uh, uh, based on that difference in that particular characteristic. But what if there were multiple characteristics that were different? How do you how do you surface what was the uh, deciding factor and which of those differentiating factors or characteristics, sorry, between those two individuals uh, that caused that change uh, to uh, uh, change in decision, uh, you know, of, of picking one person over the other? And so, essentially, you know, what are those trade-offs that we're willing to make when uh, with regards to the accuracy and the explainability? Uh, of the system. And so then, um, you know, ultimately, once you've done all of these checks, you are, um, uh, you know, looking to deploy that system into the real world. So you're sending it off uh, uh, into the world. An important, important consideration here always is to think about these systems uh, uh, being put into a social technical world. So it's, it's, never, it's never binary, it's never a lab setting um, like the one where we're doing all of this testing, evaluation, verification, and validation, we are now dealing with the realities of, uh, uh, of a complex, of a messy, uh, and messy in a good sense, messy in the sense that we are human uh, and, and we don't fit neatly into pixels and bits. Uh, we are uh, richer than that. And, and to be able to accommodate for that, I think it's very important that we um, uh, do take the social technical nature of that into consideration. Um, something that we talk a lot about uh, in this context is the notion of having a human in the loop, which is often presented as a way of, um, uh, you know, as, as, as a sort of saving grace in terms of preventing some of the uh, problems with um, these AI systems. Uh, two things that are important to keep in mind here are the notions of algorithmic aversion and automation bias. The algorithmic aversion um, is basically when the, or, or let's start with automation bias. Automation bias is basically this concept where uh, people uh, are overly trusting in, a, in an AI system uh, because they've had uh, positive prior experiences with it in terms of, let's say, the accuracy uh, of the decisions that it made. And um, the algorithmic aversion is the opposite of that. So people are less trusting of the system because they've had uh, negative prior experiences with it and hence are, are quite cautious in terms of um, uh, taking uh, the recommendations from the system, even when they themselves might be wrong and the system might be right. So again, in the case of hiring, when we're thinking about these two notions, uh, we don't want to be over-reliant on our judgment, uh, on the, sorry, judgment from the system because we might be overseeing some of the uh, uniqueness that's presented uh, when it comes to 
uh, disabilities because the model, uh, the uh, AI system probably doesn't have a very representative uh, model that's captured. And on the other hand, we also don't want to be um, uh, completely dismissive of the recommendations that are made by the system uh, to the detriment of, of uh, being exclusionary. And so essentially it's, it's never enough to um, you know, have a human in the loop. It, it's also important to think about the agency and the autonomy that that individual uh, has in that context. And so uh, maintenance uh, of that system is when we're trying to essentially think of the uh, runtime monitoring of the system and when there might be shifts in the inputs, the learned representations and the outputs of the system. And this is really important because um, when we're looking at AI systems, these are learning systems. They learn from their interaction with real world data. And so that might change uh, over time. It's not static. Uh, and and you know, having guardrails in place um, that alert us to when the system might be going off track in terms of its behavior is very important. And especially one of the things from a life cycle perspective here that we need, we should pay attention to is to have some deterministic and non-AI fail safes that the system can fall back to in case it starts to you know, scrape against those uh, guardrails um, as it's interacting with the real world. And finally, well, you know, uh, everything has a lifespan. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we, we might realize that, uh, you know, the system is, isn't just uh, achieving the goals that we wanted to achieve. And so at that point, you know, it might be uh, time to call it quits. Uh, and uh, thinking about the end of life um, uh, scenarios there is very important. So, you know, one of the premier considerations there is to think about how, well, how do we safely delete that data? Um, and then also, you know, what, what happens to the people uh, who have come to depend on that AI enabled system, uh, uh, be that, uh, you know, as something that provides assistance, uh, uh, you know, during that, uh, uh, you know, their interaction uh, in the workplace, um, or, or, you know, as we'll see in some of the challenges in terms of perhaps some of the metrics that are being used to um, evaluate the performance and the productivity um, of the employee. So what makes up AI ethics? And I know we've, uh, you know, had uh, quite a bit of discussion around bias and fairness last week. And I'll, I'll just briefly touch on some of the other pillars in this domain as well, because I think it's really, really important um, because bias and fairness don't just exist in isolation. Uh, these other pillars also have implications in terms of um, uh, how bias and fairness uh, sort of get manifested in the uh, context of uh, AI systems. So really quickly, um, uh, you know, of course, we, we spoke a lot about uh, uh, what uh, bias and fairness was um, in, in the presentations last week. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned, and, and I've put a link there, which, uh, you know, once I send over the presentation will be uh, helpful, is to think about um, uh, the different definitions of fairness, which are really important. Um, and, and a lot of them are actually incompatible with each other. Uh, which is something that is an important consideration because if you're uh, certifying a system to be fair, uh, according to which definitions uh, and who chose those definitions and uh, are we flexible enough to change uh, our evaluation according to different definitions that might come up uh, in the future, uh, those are really important considerations that we should pay attention to. Then there's the notion of privacy, which I think is really important, again, when we're thinking about the use of AI in the context of uh, the workplace, be that uh, during selection, you know, hiring, um, be that during uh, evaluation of your workplace productivity, promotions, uh, moving between departments, et cetera. Et cetera. And so you know, before we started the presentation, I, I, th I think it was Juliana who was uh, asking some questions about um, you know, uh, how do we use some of those attributes? Um, there is an extra degree of sensitivity uh, on the privacy front, um, especially when it comes to uh, the, uh, the small and uh, the, the smallness and the uh, uniqueness of some of these sample sizes, which make them particularly vulnerable. And uh, I believe in one of the uh, scenarios, we will talk about that where uh, traditional techniques uh, of privacy preservation might not be as effective. Um, and hence we need to be careful about, um, about that. 
uh, interpretability and explainability. So we, we sort of alluded to that in terms of you know, how we um, might make uh, sacrifices uh, uh, as we start to uh, you know, rely on more complicated techniques, like let's say uh, looking at neural networks versus looking at uh, uh, you know, simple regression models or looking at SVMs. Uh, and, and, and those have implications. Another thing uh, in terms of propagation to think about is to uh, not so much rely on correlations, but to think uh, or to adopt a lens of causal inference, which basically asks you to look at the underlying causality uh, when you're making um, you know, decisions within that entire um, you know, life cycle of, um, uh, of uh, you know, a, a person in the workplace. Um, you know, right up from uh, where they're hunting for jobs uh, to the point where, you know, maybe they're moving up uh, in the ladder within the system. Um, and it's essential to work with domain experts. These are essentially the people who have deep knowledge of how that organization operates and what are the important considerations there, because uh, without that, uh, we risk, um, uh, you know, giving more emphasis to correlations than causation. Uh, traceability and auditability, um, again, in the legal context, as was mentioned last week, is, is really important. Uh, without having traceable artifacts, uh, it limits our ability to audit for when discrimination is happening. And without transparency and feedback from the hiring process, uh, we really have no way of evaluating whether uh, someone is being discriminated against or not. Uh, and, and maybe in the context of government organizations, they are uh, held to higher standards, uh, but in, in certain private organizations, uh, there are limitations in terms of uh, the people who are going through this process to be able to question uh, uh, if they are being discriminated against or not. Uh, and finally, this uh, notion of machine learning security um, is, is important. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, particularly invested in this uh, uh, subdomain of AI ethics because uh, robustness to adversarial examples um, is an important notion. And, and perhaps it's not so much uh, uh, maybe relevant. Um, oh, I noticed that uh, someone posted a comment that the transcripts are not very accurate. Would it help if I spoke slower? David? Maybe, I don't know. Yes, that, that yes. could be, a, we could try that too. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, no problem. Uh, and, and let me know, uh, it, it might also be my accent, uh, which is something that uh, AI systems, I don't know, is it an AI transcription that's happening? I might be going off topic here. <laughs> this, <but. laughs> is a, this is a combination of uh, automatic speech recognition and human okay. writing, yeah. Okay, so, you know, sometimes it might be my Indian accent which the machine might be having trouble with. So <laughs> bear with me on that. Um, so yeah, if we're uh, you know, thinking about robustness to adversarial examples, it's an important notion because, uh, and, and maybe not so much in hiring, but uh, in, in the use of AI systems in general, um, one of the canonical examples in this situation is how um, uh, you know, stop signs with specifically placed graffiti can trigger failures in uh, self-drive in the computer vision systems of self-driving cars, uh, which means that it can misinterpret a stop sign as a drive at 50 miles an hour sign, which means that uh, you know that has obvious implications in terms of pedestrian safety. So we want to be careful um, when we're deploying these systems in the real world that we don't. Uh, end up in a situation where, um, uh, is it getting better? Speed is the issue. Okay, perfect. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, uh, so we do need to be careful when we're deploying these systems. So anyways, um, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of a brief overview, at least from a life cycle perspective. Um, and I think it's important, uh, uh, there are some actions that we can take uh, at an individual and at the societal level. Uh, at an individual level, uh, for those of us who are uh, already employed in different organizations uh, that have HR departments, uh, we should take proactive steps where we are aware that uh, some of these uh, places where these systems can fail. So let's be proactive in building, uh, in, sorry, in bringing up some of these concerns and making them known to the HR department so that they 
uh, do take those into considerations, be that during the procurement of a third party solution, or be that uh, perhaps during the um, uh, you know, building of an in-house system that might use uh, automated decision-making. Um, another key role, and, and it's great that we have someone from uh, uh, who works uh, in a government agency, uh, government is a market maker in a sense. Uh, you know, they have tremendous purchasing power. Uh, and if they set out clear standards and mandates, uh, then vendors do have to fall in line uh, so that they can, uh, you know, successfully bid on some of the contracts that are put out by uh, government agencies. And hence, uh, you know, government can be a market maker and a precedent setter in that context. Um, and finally, um, you know, uh, we, we all need to be more, uh, you know, or, or better educated in terms of, um, you know, how AI actually operates. And, and you know, my hope through, uh, you know, highlighting some of the uh, life cycle components is that we have a more granular understanding of how AI systems are actually built and deployed. Um, and there's uh, a great case from Finland where they've uh, put out some basic education uh, on this, uh, and it's called the Elements of AI course. Uh, and, and it's linked in the presentation for those who might be interested. And so, uh, you know, education and awareness is, a, a, again, a great instrument uh, for us being more proactive um, and, um, uh, you know, thinking about these. Uh, and then, you know, just wanted to give a quick mention about some of the things that uh, I'm working on. So uh, I'm writing a book uh, on this very subject, uh, uh, well, uh, on a, or I guess on a related subject uh, called actionable AI ethics. And essentially the idea there is to put some of these principles, uh, which can sometimes be quite abstract uh, into concrete practices. And I take that life cycle approach that I uh, mentioned today. Um, I, I'm also working on uh, something called data science and machine learning failures, uh, which also uh, looks at where systems fail. And this is particularly relevant to the notion, uh, to sorry, to the use of uh, uh, AI systems in uh, this entire workplace uh, and hiring uh, process because um, there are you know many spectacular failures in this case. Some of them very public, but some of them not so public. And I think those are important to discuss. Uh, of course, uh, there's my email uh, in case you ever want to continue the discussions. And obviously, you'll have access to the slides, so um, you can take a look at that information there. Um, well, finally, let's. I guess, get into the challenges. Great, thank you very much, Abhishek. And now, Gloria is going to help us to divide in three groups. You have received the email with the challenge and the group that you're going to participate. Mm -hmm. The co-design, some of you already know how to work in a co-design. We start first reading the challenge be sure that you understand the challenge. Mm? That is the first discussion. Then you move to try how we can address from a policy perspective this challenge with your own ideas. Mm? The uh, Shira, Eva, and, and Juliana is going to take notes of your ideas, no? Uh, Shira, Juliana, and Eva, feel free to use any, any, any platform, and then you can share with us, with Arjun, that, okay? 